Hi, Dr. Zach here. Hope you guys are all having a great day. It's a beautiful day here in Colorado again, uh, enjoying some sunshine. And I want to take a, a little bit of time today and talk about um, some testing protocols for, for COVID-19. And what prompted this, I got a call from a good buddy of mine that I went to high school with years ago, and we've maintained a really close friendship over the years. And uh, he and his wife were planning a trip. They needed to do a little getaway, and they were going to go visit some uh, some kids and grandkids up in Alaska. And uh, Alaska is requiring that uh, if you're gonna travel up there, you need to show that you've tested negative for COVID-19 within a few days prior to your departure. And if you don't, then you have to self-quarantine up there for 14 days. We've seen several states that are doing a similar thing. I know that uh, as we were traveling through uh, New Mexico a while back, they said that uh, you know if you stay here, you have to quarantine for 14 days. I know that you hear about people in Hawaii that go out there for vacation and they can't do any vacation for 14 days because they have to hole up in their hotel room um, or wherever they are. So we know that there's these uh, quarantine rules. And so this is uh, apparently true in Alaska as well. So anyway, uh, to make a, a long story, maybe hopefully a little bit less long, um, my friend and his wife set up a time to go get tested. A uh, little overview, he's uh, self-described reckless when it comes to, to COVID regulations or recommendations. Uh, does not mask up at all, is really kind of against the whole masking thing. Um, they just spent some time traveling on their motorcycle across Utah and doing some, a lot of outdoor stuff, hiking, biking, a lot of other activities going on. And he's self-described as reckless or non-compliant. His wife, on the other hand, is a pharmacy tech. And as such, she has very strict guidelines that she has to comply with and uh, masking all the time, making sure that she's, you know, cleaning off surfaces and doing everything that, so that she can, you know, keep from spreading um, COVID-19. So anyway, they go in last week and they get tested. And uh, he described to me some of the paperwork they had to fill out, some of the information that was on the back of the paperwork, and I'll allude to that in just a minute. But uh, interesting, he called me up and said, hey, we got our results back. Um, my wife is positive and I'm negative. And he was confused. He goes, how can that happen? Wait, I'm the one that's at risk. I'm the one that's been reckless. I'm the one that's been breathing and, and so forth. And she's the one that's been protecting. And if she would have picked it up from anybody, she would have picked it up from me. How, do, how does this happen? And uh, so we had a little discussion about this. And the bottom line is that in looking at all of the different types of testing, and there's different times, there's there the types, there's looking for antibodies, which is to see if you've had it over the course of a period of time. There's looking to see if you've got active um, case of COVID-19 going on. Um, unfortunately, with the statistics that we're seeing, they're putting all of those into the same pile so that we're not necessarily seeing which cases are active now. We're seeing a cumulative number of cases. So the more testing we do, and if we're getting people that have either now an active case or they've had it at some point during this, this whole COVID situation, we're seeing the numbers spike. And so we're being told that there's a surge and we got all this going on. So that's that's a different story. I've talked a little bit about that in the past, but the bottom line is whatever kind of testing you do, at best, they're telling us that they're 70% accurate. That means they're 30% of the time it's inaccurate. How do you know whether you're one of the accurate or one of the inaccurate? What if his is accurate and hers isn't or vice versa? So they drive away from there, they get the results, they have to reschedule their Alaska trip because now they can't go up there without quarantining. Um, but how do you know who's came out right, who's came out wrong, or if they both came out wrong, or if they both came out right? We don't know because 70% reliable isn't very reliable. You know, think about it from, from a, a food source perspective. Say that you're running to the supermarket and you went to the produce section and there was 10 apples sitting there in the bin. And three of those were uh, the, the snow white apples, right? Poisoned and they're gonna put you to sleep. And the other seven are fine, they're, they're not tainted at all. And so you're gonna grab an apple. How confident are you grabbing an apple? Yeah, I was talking to a patient earlier this week and he said, I would be more comfortable playing Russian roulette. At least there you have a, a one in six chance of, of um, you know, having it fail on you as opposed to a 30% chance. So anyway, we don't necessarily know the accuracy. So that's, that's part of it. I talked in a previous video about the R number dropping, which means the, the fact that as viruses mutate, they tend to get weaker over time as they mutate and that we tend to have 
uh, an immune system that tend to get stronger over time as we're exposed to things, if we're doing things uh, by properly exposing ourselves. And so we see that it becomes less and less and less spreadable. Um, and it, it also really depends upon, you know, how your immune system has been working um, as you've become, you know, in contact with different people. So the bottom line is, is that we don't know. We don't know what's going on. But I want to bring it back again to what he talked about on the paperwork. He said the paperwork was like applying for a house. So you're filling out all kinds of data about yourself, including social security number and, and everything else that goes on, which means, guess what? You're being put into a database. You're being put into a registry. For me and for a lot of people, that is a little bit of a red flag. I don't necessarily want to, to be put into a registry. Um, so that's, that's an issue. The other part of it is, as he was reading the back of it, as they were waiting in line, it said that, you know, if you choose not to go through and get this test done, you're still sick and you're still possibly contagious. So be careful, go home and, and self-isolate is essentially what it said. So there was this assumption that if you're in line waiting to get tested, that you're positive. And really the test is almost just to, you have to kind of prove yourself negative or you're going to be considered positive. And you may kind of go, oh, that doesn't sound quite right. But uh, I have a friend of mine who's a doctor in, in Texas. In Texas, we hear about the, just the massive numbers and so forth that's going on. And he had a patient of his that came in and said, you know, my parents were in line to get tested for COVID-19. And they'd waited for about two hours and they got tired of waiting, so they left. A couple days later, they get results back that say that they both tested positive. They never got tested. They get results back and they get tested positive. This doctor made a comment on his Facebook page about this and got 20 to 30 more people that commented and said, yeah, the same thing happened to people I know or same thing happened to me. It wasn't a random rare occurrence. It wasn't something that was made up. It was something that we see is happening really on a regular basis. So if you fill out the paperwork and you don't get the test, chances are you're gonna test positive. So what do you do with that? Well, it comes back to this, is that at some point we have to go, something might be, a little bit sketchy with all this. And, I, and I'm not here to tell you that this whole thing is a conspiracy. You can come to that conclusion by yourself if you choose to. But, but here's what I want to say is, is that there has been a whole lot of shifting in the way that we look at life and the way that we live our lives because of something that is completely unreliable, unpredictable. It, it makes no sense how things line up. And I'm really wanting us to kind of assess and think and process through this and say, what if it isn't about a virus? What if there's other stuff that's going on? What if, you know, even coming back to the masking, what if that's to cover us up and hide our voice, to, to, to make it to where you can't see each other's expressions and engage each other in the same way that we normally do? I hear here in Colorado, our governor has, has encouraged people to shame people who are not complying. And I saw that happen, or I heard that happen uh, about a week and a half ago with, with my son and his girlfriend. They were at King Supers in Fort Collins. And this lady came up to them and just started railing on them and said, who is paying you to spread disease? And she was throwing out F-bombs and she was cursing them and she was yelling at them to put their masks on. And she went and got management and, and did all of these things to shame them, to, to, to create a scene when if she was really afraid of a germ, she might have just walked the other direction. We're being encouraged to tattletale on our neighbors. Um, so for me, who chooses not to buy into this whole narrative that's going on and to say, no, 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 I, it doesn't make sense. And I, I hope that I can maintain the right to be able to make those decisions myself. I'm not wearing a mask in public. And I, I you know, confess that I'm not doing it because I hate people. I'm not doing it because I feel like I'm gonna be spreading disease to people and I don't care about their health and their well-being. I don't do it because I don't respect them. I respect them to be able to make a choice for themselves to do what they wanna do. And if they have faith that their mask is gonna work for them, I respect that. I don't have faith to that level in that mask. I have more faith in my body's immune system to deal with things than I do in a mask. I have more faith in their immune system to handle things than their mask. But we should be able to make those decisions and those choices ourselves. In my last video, I talked about how 
maybe we need to start letting our voices be heard again instead of muzzled. Maybe we need, if we don't agree with the narrative that we're being given, that maybe we should step up and start making a change. And I've had several people say, yes, yes, what do you, what, 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 what do you recommend? What can we do? You know, tell your politicians that they represent you and your beliefs. But I had an idea this morning as I was talking to my team and, and thinking about my son who had been you know, verbally assaulted uh, with his girlfriend when they were in the supermarket and even talking to, to my wife and other people in here that really do, you know, I've shared this in the past, the, the term that my, our judo coach says is that when he walks into a public place without a mask, he, he feels like he's being treated like a hooker in church. And, and that could be a challenge for us. We can get tired of, of that. We can get tired of getting those those negative glances or having people that are judging us or, you know, following the governor's guidelines and actually shaming us. So, but at the same time, I want us to be able to exercise that and not get broken down, not not feel like that, you know, we're, we're getting beat up on that. So here's a recommendation I have is that if we can come together as a community that says, you know what, I believe that we can make choices on our own. I believe that that I don't necessarily have to, I know that by my, my rights as a human being and a citizen of the United States, I don't have to wear a mask when I go to King Supers or to the supermarket. Um, but if we could go as a group, invite four or five of your friends and go with you, and then you've got four or five of you that, that are gonna be a little bit harder to attack. But here's what also might happen is that there might be people that are masking up because they're avoiding conflict when they don't think it's something they really want to do. And I don't condemn people for that. I, I understand that completely. Um, you know, pick your battle, right? Um, but they might look and they, they might actually kind of go, hey, there's some other people. I'm a little less self-conscious or a little less concerned about, you know, getting, you know, the, the, the stink eye that, that comes from people. And they're able to take their mask off. And then maybe somebody else. And then maybe somebody else. And that just by taking and exercising some of our freedom, we might be able to get to a tipping point. And I think that Malcolm Gladwell in his book, Tipping Point, talked about something about 11%. If we can get like 11% of us, instead of right now, you know, close to 0%, actually showing up with exercising our freedom and our belief to, to be expressive and to let our voices be heard and let our faces be seen, that there might be less shaming taking place, that there might be less people doing it just because they don't wanna have a battle. They might be able to come out and start, start exercising things more freely. So that might be something to consider. Next time you go to the store, invite somebody to go with you. Um, let people see your face. If you see somebody that doesn't have a mask, tell them, hey, it's great to see your face. Encourage them. And as we can encourage each other, we can express our freedoms a little bit more effectively. Now. For those of you that, and I know there's people out there watching and listening that, that don't agree with me at all with this. I hope that you'll agree with me that at least it's nice to be able to make some choices on things. And I'm not saying think things my way. I'm not saying do what I say to do. I'm saying let's think and let's act and behave appropriately um, and be able to make the choices for ourselves based upon the information that, that we take in and we receive and we look at and we we process through the colored lenses that we're looking through and everything else that, that we're doing. And let's respect others for being able to do the same thing. You know, when I am walking through a supermarket and I don't have a mask on and you do and you believe that, that I should have one on, don't think that I'm disrespecting you. Respect, I think, should be a two-way street. I respect you to be able to do that. And I respect you to have confidence that that's working please respect me as well and other people who aren't doing things the exact same way. So with that, food for thought, it's not live Dr. Zach's way or, or you're, you're not right. It's live the way that's according to what you think, what you believe, what you feel in your heart, and honor people who are able to do the same thing. God bless you guys. I, I appreciate those that listen. I, I do like the comments I get back, positive and negative that come with that, um, and recognize that you know, I don't profess to be an expert. I profess to be somebody who thinks and tries to process through things and tries to formulate some responses based on that. So I encourage you to do the same thing. Till next time, God bless you guys.